Chapter 10 The Bab Sojourn in Isfahan The summer of the year AH 1262, AD 1846, was drawing to a close when the Bab bade his last farewell to his native city of Shiraz and proceeded to Isfahan. Seed Qasim i Zanjani accompanied him on that journey. As he approached the outskirts of the city, he wrote a letter to the governor of the province, Manushir Khan, the Mutamidud Dawle, in which he requested him to signify his wish as to the place where he could dwell. The letter which he entrusted to Seed Qasim was expressive of such courtesy and revealed such exquisite penmanship that the Mutamid was moved to instruct the Sultanul Ulama, the Imam Jumi of Isfahan, the foremost ecclesiastical authority of that province, to receive the Bab in his own home and to accord him a kindly and generous reception. In addition to his message, the governor sent the Imam Jumi the letter he had received from the Bab. The Sultanul Ulama accordingly bade his own brother whose savage cruelty in later years earned him the appellation of Raksha from Baha'u'llah. Footnote says Raksha means female serpent. To proceed with a number of his favorite companions to meet and escort the expected visitor to the gate of the city. As the Bab approached, the Imam Jumi went out to welcome him in person and conducted him ceremoniously to his house. Such were the honors accorded to the Bab in those days that when, on a certain Friday, he was returning from the public bath to the house, a multitude of people were seen eagerly clamoring for the water which he had used for his ablutions. His fervent admirers firmly believed in his unfailing virtue and power to heal their sicknesses and ailments. The Imam Jumi himself had, from the very first night, become so enamored with him who was the object of such devotion that, assuming the functions of an attendant, he undertook to minister to the needs and wants of his beloved guests. Seizing the ewer from the hand of the chief steward, and utterly ignoring the customary dignity of his rank, he proceeded to pour out the water over the hands of the barb. One night after supper, the Imam Jumi, whose curiosity had been excited by the extraordinary traits of character which his youthful guest had revealed, ventured to request him to reveal a commentary on the Siri of Val Asr, which is the Quran 103. His request was readily granted. Calling for pen and paper, the Bab, with astonishing rapidity and without the least premeditation, began to reveal, in the presence of his host, a most illuminating interpretation of the aforementioned Suri. It was nearing midnight when the Bab found himself engaged in the exposition of the manifold implications involved in the first letter of that Suri. That letter, the letter Vav, upon which Sheikh Ahmadi Asai had already laid such emphasis in his writings, symbolized for the Bab the advent of a new cycle of divine revelation, and has since been alluded to by Baha'u'llah in the Kitabi Akdas in such passages as the mystery of the great reversal and the sign of the sovereign. The Bab soon after began to chant, in the presence of his host and his companions, the homily with which he had prefaced his commentary on the Suri. Those words of power confounded his hearers with wonder. They seemed as if bewitched by the magic of his voice. Instinctively they started to their feet and together with the Imam Jumi reverently kissed the hem of his garment. Ullah Muhammad taqi i harati an eminent mushtahid, broke out into a sudden expression of exultation and praise Peerless and unique, he exclaimed, as are the words which have streamed from this pen to be able to reveal within so short a time and in so legible a writing so great a number of verses as to equal a fourth, nay, a third of the Koran, is in itself an achievement such as no mortal, without the intervention of God, could hope to perform. Neither the cleaving of the moon nor the quickening of the pebbles of the sea can compare with so mighty an act. As the Bab's fame was being gradually diffused over the entire city of Isfahan, an unceasing stream of visitors flowed from every quarter to the house of the Imam Jumi. A few to satisfy their curiosity, others to obtain a deeper understanding of the fundamental verities of his faith, and still others to seek the remedy for their ills and sufferings. The Mutamid himself came one day to visit the Bab, 
and while seated in the midst of an assemblage of the most brilliant and accomplished divines of Isfahan, requested him to expound the nature and demonstrate the validity of the Nubuvat i Khasi, which is Muhammad's specific mission. He had previously, in that same gathering, called upon those who were present to adduce such proofs and evidences in support of this fundamental article of their faith as would constitute an unanswerable testimony for those who were inclined to repudiate its truth. No one, however, seemed capable of responding to his invitation. Which do you prefer? asked the Bab. A verbal or a written answer to your question? A written reply, he answered not only would please those who are present at this meeting, but would edify and instruct both the present and the future generations. The Bab instantly took up his pen and began to write. In less than two hours he had filled about fifty pages with a most refreshing and circumstantial inquiry into the origin, the character, and the pervasive influence of Islam. The originality of his dissertation the vigour and vividness of the style, the accuracy of its minutest details, invested his treatment of that noble theme with an excellence which no one among those who were present on that occasion could have failed to perceive. With masterly insight, he linked the central idea in the concluding passage of this exposition with the advent of the promised Qaim and the expected return of the Imam Hussein. The footnotes says reference to his own mission and to Baha'u'llah's subsequent revelation. He argued with such force and courage that those who heard him recite its verses were astounded by the magnitude of his revelation. No one dared to insinuate the slightest objection, much less openly to challenge his statements. The Mutamid could not help giving vent to his enthusiasm and joy. Hear me, he exclaimed, members of this revered assembly, I take you as my witnesses. Never until this day have I in my heart been firmly convinced of the truth of Islam. I can henceforth, thanks to this exposition penned by this youth, declare myself a firm believer in the faith proclaimed by the Apostle of God. I solemnly testify to my belief in the reality of the superhuman power with which this youth is endowed, a power which no amount of learning can ever impart. With these words, he brought the meeting to an end. The growing popularity of the Bab aroused the resentment of the ecclesiastical authorities of Isfahan, who viewed with concern and envy the ascendancy which an unlearned youth was slowly acquiring over the thoughts and consciences of their followers. They firmly believed that unless they rose to stem the tide of popular enthusiasm, the very foundations of their existence would be undermined. A few of the more sagacious among them thought it wise to abstain from acts of direct hostility to either the person or the teachings of the Bab, as such action they felt would serve only to enhance his prestige and consolidate his position. The mischief-makers, however, were busily engaged in disseminating the wildest report concerning the character and claims of the Bab. These reports soon reached Tehran and were brought to the attention of Haji Mirza Akazi, the Grand Vizier of Muhammad Shah. This haughty and overbearing minister viewed with apprehension the possibility that his sovereign might one day feel inclined to befriend the Bab, an inclination which he felt sure would precipitate his own downfall. The Haji was, moreover, apprehensive lest the Mutamid, who enjoyed the confidence of the Shah, should succeed in arranging an interview between the sovereign and the Bab. He was well aware that should such an interview take place, the impressionable and tender-hearted Muhammad Shah would be completely won over by the attractiveness and novelty of that creed. Spurred on by such reflections, he addressed a strongly worded communication to the Imam Jumi, in which he upbraided him for his grave neglect of the obligation imposed upon him to safeguard the interests of Islam. We had expected you, Haji Mirza Akazi wrote him, to resist with all your power every cause which conflicts with the best interests of the government and the people of this land. You seem instead to have befriended, nay, to have glorified the author of this obscure and contemptible movement. He likewise wrote a number of encouraging letters to the ulamas of Isfahan, whom he had previously ignored, but upon whom he now lavished his special favours. 
The Imam Jumi, while refusing to alter his respectful attitude towards his guest, was induced by the tone of the message he had received from the Grand Vizier to instruct his associates to devise such means as would tend to lessen their ever-increasing number of visitors who thronged each day to the presence of the Bab. Mohammed Misi, surnamed the Safihul Ulama, son of the late Haji Kalbasi, in his desire to gratify the wish and to earn the esteem of Haji Mirza Akazi, began to calumniate the Bab from the pulpit in the most unseemly language. As soon as the Mutamid was informed of these developments, he sent a message to the Imam Jumi in which he reminded him of the visit he as governor had paid to the Bab and extended to him, as well as to his guest, an invitation to his home. The Mutamid invited Haji Seed Asadullah, son of the late Haji Seed Muhammad Bakir i Rashti, Haji Muhammad Jafar i Abadi, Muhammad Mihdi, Mirza Hassan i Nuri, and a few others to be present at the meeting. Haji Seed Asadullah refused the invitation and endeavoured to dissuade those who had been invited from participating in that gathering. I have sought to excuse myself, he informed them, and I would most certainly urge you to do the same. I regard it as most unwise of you to meet the Seed i Bab face to face. He will, he will, no doubt, reassert his claim and will, in support of his argument, adduce whatever proof you may desire him to give and without the least hesitation will reveal as a testimony to the truth he bears verses of such number as would equal half the Koran. In the end he will challenge you in these words, Produce likewise if ye be men of truth. We can in no wise successfully resist him. If we disdain to answer him, our impotence will have been exposed. If we, on the other hand, submit to his claim, we shall not only be forfeiting our own reputation, our own prerogatives and rights, but will have committed ourselves to acknowledge any further claims that he may feel inclined to make in the future. Haji Muhammad Jafar heeded this counsel and refused to accept the invitation of the governor. Muhammad Mihdi, Mirza Hassan Inuri, and a few others who disdained such advice presented themselves at the appointed hour at the home of the Mutamid. At the invitation of the host, Mirza Hassan, a noted Platonist, requested the Bab to elucidate certain abstruse philosophical doctrines connected with the Arshi of Mulasadra, the meaning of which only a few had been able to unravel. In simple and unconventional language, the Bab replied to each of his questions. Mirza Hassan, though unable to apprehend the meaning of the answers which he had received, realized how inferior was the learning of the so-called exponents of the Platonic and the Aristotelian schools of thought of his day to the knowledge displayed by that youth. Muhammad Mihdi ventured in his turn to question the Bab regarding certain aspects of the Islamic law. Dissatisfied with the explanation he received, he began to contend idly with the Bab. He was soon silenced by the Mutamid, who, cutting short his conversation, turned to an attendant and, bidding him to light the lantern, gave the order that Muhammad Mihdi be immediately conducted to his home. The Mutamid subsequently confided his apprehensions to the Imam Jumi. I fear the machinations of the enemies of the Seyyid i Bab, he told him. The Shah has summoned him to Tehran. I am commanded to arrange for his departure. I deem it more advisable for him to stay in my home until such time as he can leave this city. The Imam Jumi acceded to his request and returned alone to his house. The Bab had tarried forty days at the residence of the Imam Jumi. While he was still there, a certain Mullah Muhammad Taqi i Harati, who was privileged to meet the Bab every day, undertook, with his consent, to translate one of his works, entitled Rizali i Furu i Adliye, from the original Arabic into Persian. The service he thereby rendered to the Persian believers was marred, however, by his subsequent behaviour. Fear suddenly seized him, and he was induced eventually to sever his connection with his fellow believers. Ere the Bab had transferred his residence to the house of the Mutamid, Mirza Ibrahim, father of the Sultanush Shuhada and elder brother of Mirza Muhammad Ali Inari, to whom we have already referred, invited the Bab to his home one night. Mirza Ibrahim was a friend of the Imam Jumi, was intimately associated with him, and controlled the management of all his affairs. 
The banquet which was spread for the bard that night was one of unsurpassed magnificence. It was, it was commonly observed that neither the officials nor the notables of the city had offered a feast of such magnitude and splendour. The Sultanush Shuhada and his brother, the Mabubush Shuhada, were the lads of nine and eleven, respectively, served at the banquet and received special attention from the barb. That night, during dinner, Mirza Ibrahim turned to his guest and said, My brother, Mirza Muhammad Ali, has no child. I beg you to intercede in his behalf and to grant his heart's desire. The barb took a portion of the food with which he had been served, placed it with his own hands on a platter, and handed it to his host, asking him to take it to Mirza Muhammad Ali and his wife. Let them both partake of this, he said. Their wish will be fulfilled. By virtue of that portion which the barb had chosen to bestow upon her, the wife of Mirza Muhammad Ali conceived and in due time gave birth to a girl, who eventually was joined in wedlock with the most great branch. This is a reference to Muniri Khanum's marriage with Abdul Baha, a union that came to be regarded as a consummation of the hopes entertained by her parents. The high honours accorded to the Bab served further to inflame the hostility of the ulamas. With feelings of dismay they beheld on every side evidences of his all-pervasive influence invading the stronghold of orthodoxy and subverting their foundations. They summoned they summoned a gathering at which they issued a written document, signed and sealed by all the ecclesiastical leaders of the city, condemning the Bab to death. They all concurred in this condemnation, with the exception of Haji Seed Asadullah and Haji Muhammad Jafar i Abadi, both of whom refused to associate themselves with the contents of so glaringly abusive a document. The Imam Jumi, though declining to endorse the death warrant of the Bab, was induced by reason of his extreme cowardice and ambition to add to that document in his own handwriting the following testimony. I testify that in the course of my association with this youth I have been unable to discover any act that would in any way betray his repudiation of the doctrines of Islam. On the contrary, I have known him as a pious and loyal observer of its precepts. The extravagance of his claims, however, and his disdainful contempt for the things of the world incline me to believe that he is devoid of reason and judgment. No sooner had the Mutamid been informed of the condemnation pronounced by the ulamas of Isfahan that he determined, by a plan which he himself conceived, to nullify the effects of that cruel verdict. He issued immediate instructions that towards the hour of sunset the Bab escorted by five hundred horsemen of the governor's own mounted bodyguard, should leave the gate of the city and proceed in the direction of Tehran. Imperative orders had been given that at the completion of each farsang, one hundred of this mounted escort should return directly to Isfahan. To the chief of the last remaining contingent, a man in whom he placed implicit confidence, the Mutamid confidentially intimated his desire that, at every Maidan, twenty of the remaining hundred should likewise be ordered by him to return to the city. Of the twenty remaining horsemen, the Mutamid directed that ten should be dispatched to Ardistan for the purpose of collecting the taxes levied by the government, and that the rest, all of whom should be of his tried and most reliable men, should, by an unfrequented route, bring the Bab back in disguise to Isfahan. They were, moreover, instructed so to regulate their march that before dawn of the ensuing day the Bab should have arrived at Isfahan and should have been delivered into his custody. This plan was immediately taken in hand and duly executed. At an unsuspected hour the Bab re-entered the city, was directly conducted to the private residence of the Mutamid, known by the name of imarat e kurshid and was introduced a side entrance reserved for the Mutamid himself into his private apartments. The governor waited in person on the bar, served his meals, and provided whatever was required for his comfort and safety. A footnote says, Thus this room in which I find myself, which has neither doors nor definite limits, is today the highest of the dwellings of paradise, for the tree of truth lives therein. It would seem that all the atoms of the room sing in one voice. 
In truth I am God. There is no other God beside me, the Lord of all things. And they sing above all the rooms of the earth, even above those adorned with mirrors of gold. If, however, the tree of truth abides in one of these ornamented rooms, then the atoms of their mirrors sing that song as did and do the atoms of the mirrors of the palace Sadri. For in the days of Sad, Isfahan, he abode therein. From the Persian Bayan, Volume 1, page 128. Meanwhile, the wildest conjectures obtained currency in the city regarding the journey of the Bab to Tehran, the sufferings which he was made to endure on his way to the capital, the verdict which had been pronounced against him, and the penalty which he had suffered. These rumours greatly distressed the believers who were residing in Isfahan. The Mutamid, who was well aware of their grief and anxiety, interceded with the Bab in their behalf, and begged to be allowed to introduce them to his presence. The Bab addressed a few words in his own handwriting to Mullah Abdul Karim i Qazvini, who had taken up his quarters in the Madrisi of Nim Avad, and instructed the Mutamid to send it to him by a trusted messenger. An hour later, Mullah Abdul Karim was ushered into the presence of the Bab. Of his arrival, no one except the Mutamid was informed. He received from his master some of his writings and was instructed to transcribe them in collaboration with Seed Hussein i Yazdi and Sheikh Hassan i Zanuzi. To these he soon returned, bearing the welcome news of the Bab's well-being and safety. Of all the believers residing in Isfahan, these three alone were allowed to see him. One day, while seated with the Bab in his private garden within the courtyard of his house, the Mutamid, taking his guest into his confidence, addressed him in these words. The Almighty Giver has endowed me with great riches. I know not how best to use them. Now that I have, by the aid of God, been led to recognize this revelation, it is my ardent desire to consecrate all my possessions to the furtherance of its interests and the spread of its fame. It is my intention to proceed by your leave to Tehran, and to do my best to win to this cause Muhammad Shah, whose confidence in me is firm and unshaken. I am certain that he will eagerly embrace it, and will arise to promote it far and wide. I will also endeavour to induce the Shah to dismiss the profligate Haji Mirza Qazi, the folly of whose administration has well nigh brought this land to the verge of ruin. Next, I will strive to obtain for you the hand of one of the sisters of the Shah, and will myself undertake the preparation of your nuptials. Finally, I hope to be able to incline the hearts of the rulers and kings of the earth to this most wondrous cause, and to extirpate every lingering trace of that corrupt ecclesiastical hierarchy that has stained the fair name of Islam. May God requite you for your noble intentions, the Bab replied. So lofty a purpose is to me even more precious than the act itself. Your days and mine are numbered, however. They are too short to enable me to witness and allow you to achieve the realization of your hopes. Not by the means which you fondly imagine will an almighty providence accomplish the triumph of his faith. Through the poor and lowly of this land, by the blood which these shall have shed in his path, Will the omnipotent sovereign ensure the preservation and consolidate the foundation of his cause? That same God will, in the world to come, place upon your head the crown of immortal glory, and will shower upon you his inestimable blessings. Of the span of your earthly life there remain only three months and nine days, after which you shall, with faith and certitude, hasten to your eternal abode. The Mutamid greatly rejoiced at these words. Resigned to the will of God, he prepared himself for the departure which the words of the Bab had so clearly foreshadowed. He wrote his testament, settled his private affairs, and bequeathed whatever he possessed to the Bab. Immediately after his death, however, his nephew, the rapacious Gurgin Khan, discovered and destroyed his will, seized his property, and contemptuously ignored his wishes. As the days of his earthly life were drawing to a close, the Mutamid increasingly saw the presence of the Bab, and, in his hours of intimate fellowship with him, obtained a deeper realization of the spirit which animated his faith. As the hour of my departure approaches, he one day told the Bab, 
I feel an undefinable joy pervading my soul. But I am apprehensive for you. I tremble at the thought of being compelled to leave you to the mercy of so ruthless a successor as Gurgin Khan. He will, no doubt, discover your presence in this home, and will, I fear, grievously ill-treat you. Fear not, remonstrated the Bab. I have committed myself into the hands of God. My trust is in him. Such is the power which he has bestowed upon me, that if it be my wish, I can convert these very stones into gems of inestimable value, and can instill into the heart of the most wicked criminal the loftiest conceptions of uprightness and duty. Of my own will have I chosen to be afflicted by my enemies, that God might accomplish the things destined to be done, at last is a quotation from the Quran, 8.42. As those precious hours flew by, a sense of overpowering devotion, of increased consciousness of nearness to God, filled the heart of the Mutamid. In his eyes, the world's pomp and pageantry melted away into insignificance and brought face to face with the eternal realities enshrined in the revelation of the Bab. His vision of its glories, its infinite potentialities, its incalculable blessings, grew in vividness as he increasingly realized the vanity of earthly ambition and the limitations of human endeavor. He continued to ponder these thoughts in his heart until the time when a slight attack of fever which lasted but one night terminated his life. Serene and confident, he winged his flight to the great beyond. He died, according to E.G. Brown, from a traveller's narrative, note L, page 277, as the life of the Mutamid was approaching its end, the Bab summoned to his presence, Seed Hussein Yazdi and Mullah Abdul Karim, acquainted them with the nature of his prediction to his host, and bade them to tell the believers who had gathered in the city to scatter throughout Kashan, Qum, and Tehran, and await whatever providence in his wisdom might choose to decree. A few days after the death of the Mutamid, a certain person who was aware of the design which he had conceived and carried out for the protection of the Bab informed his successor, Gurgil Khan, of the actual residence of the Bab in the Amarat i Kurshid, and described to him the honors which his predecessor had lavished upon his guest in the privacy of his own home. On the receipt of this unexpected intelligence, Gurgin Khan dispatched his messenger to Tehran and instructed him to, to deliver in person the following message to Muhammad Shah. Four months ago it was generally believed in Isfahan that, in pursuance of your majesty's imperial summons, the Mutamidud Dawle, my predecessor, has sent the Seyyid Ibab to the seat of your majesty's government. It is now being disclosed that this same Seyyid is actually occupying the Emirat i Kurshid, the private residence of the Mutamidud Dawle. It has been ascertained that my predecessor himself extended the hospitality of his home to the Seyyid Ibab and sedulously guarded that secret from both the people and the officials of this city. Whatever it pleases your majesty to decree, I unhesitatingly pledge myself to perform. The Shah was firmly convinced of the loyalty of the Mutamid, realized when he received this message that the late governor's sincere intention had been to await a favorable occasion when he could arrange a meeting between him and the Bab, and that his sudden death had interfered with the execution of that plan. He issued an imperial mandate summoning the Bab to the capital. In his written message to Gurgin Khan, the Shah commanded him to send the Bab in disguise in the company of a mounted escort headed by Mohammed Big E. Charparchi. Chaparchi means courier, of the sect of the Aliyullahi to Tehran, to exercise the utmost consideration towards him in the course of his journey, and strictly to maintain the secrecy of his departure. Gurgin Khan went immediately to the Bab and delivered into his hands the written mandate of the sovereign. He then summoned Muhammad Big, conveyed to him the behests of Muhammad Shah, and ordered him to undertake immediate preparations for the journey. Beware, he warned him, lest anyone discover his identity or suspect the nature of your mission. No one but you, not even the members of his escort, should be allowed to recognize him. Should anyone question you concerning him, say that he is a merchant whom we have been instructed to conduct to the capital, 
and of whose identity we are completely ignorant. Soon after midnight, the Bab, in accordance with those instructions, set out from the city and proceeded in the direction of Tehran. <laughs>